So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lisa Goodman. I'm with the communications and marketing team at St. Charles Health System. And uh, we welcome you to our town hall today. Uh, before we get started, just a number of housekeeping items. Uh, the news media is joining us today as panelists, and they will have the ability to ask questions at the end of this presentation via either the chat function or by virtually raising their hand. Um, we did experience some technical difficulties today broadcasting this live to Facebook and YouTube. Uh, our sincere apologies that we are posting this recording. We had hoped you could be here with us live. Uh, but if after watching this you have questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to our team. You can definitely do that through our Facebook and YouTube pages, and we will do our very best to get in touch with you and respond. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Erin uh, Adams, who is the president of our St. Charles Bend and Redmond Hospitals, and he's going to take it from there. So Erin. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our town hall this afternoon. Um, again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron Adams. I'm the president for the Ben and Redmond Hospitals here at St. Charles, and I'm joined today by several of my colleagues, um, Dr. Doug Merrill, who's our chief medical officer for both Ben and Redmond, uh, Ms. Julie Ostrom, who's the senior director for perioperative and cardiovascular services here at the Ben campus, and Dr. Cynthia Marie, who's our medical director for infection prevention and antibiotic stewardship for our broader health system. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I think it goes without saying that many are aware of the challenges we face, uh, both as a community and uh, amongst the healthcare environment, both nationally um, in the state of Oregon and, and here in Central Oregon itself. So our goal today was really to spend some time talking about some of those challenges, talking about what we're facing, particularly uh, here at St. Charles, um, spent a little bit of time talking about not just those challenges, but some of the things we're doing to try to respond and improve the situation. And uh, then talk a little bit about how people in the community can participate and be part of the solutions, all of which are very important. Uh, I think it's important to note that what we're facing isn't just in healthcare, it is a community issue. And we do need to come together if we're going to be successful in uh, changing our circumstance. So again, thank you for joining today. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Doug Merrill to get us started. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks again, everybody. Uh, we'll start with just taking a quick look at what's happening in the hospitals. Uh, I know you all keep hearing the word crisis, and we'll try to dive in and give you an idea of what that means. Next slide. So on the left-hand side, as we focus on surgical services, um, we note that there have been a large number of patients who had to be uh, had to have their surgery canceled just since the latter part of April due to the COVID surges that we experienced uh, through May and ongoing. Uh, so there's 257 folks who haven't been able to get surgery. And although we sometimes refer to this as elective surgery, we are now talking about folks who've been waiting for surgery for well over a year, and in some cases uh, face rather dire medical circumstances as a result. Uh, since Memorial Day uh, of this year, we've had almost half of our surgical blocks released, and those are the times that are assigned to specific surgeons those surgeons have released those blocks because their patients have gone through so many cancellations that they thought it was inappropriate to keep scheduling. So that's a significant sign of how much cancellation we've had to do. And as a result of all this, over the period of time we've been in the pandemic, which is now reaching 18 months, uh, the backlog of surgical procedures that we have not been able to uh, accommodate has reached uh, 2,500 or so. To work uh, through this problem, we've created a surgical triage committee, uh, which will uh, take a look at each surgical procedure that is being scheduled and uh, which requires an inpatient hospital bed. And those uh, cases will be reviewed and prioritized uh, with regard to patient need. The surgical cases that are outpatient and don't require a hospital bed are still moving forward as scheduled. Next slide. 
Another significant pain point um, that you'll recognize if you'll come to our hospital is that our emergency rooms are extraordinarily busy. Uh, there's been an uh, overall increase in emergency room visits reaching 20% uh, or more on many days. Uh, and this is due to patients not having been able to get in to have their uh, chronic diseases managed uh, during the course of the pandemic when clinics were closed. Uh, in addition, because there's such a high volume in the emergency rooms, uh, as many as three to 10% of patients leave without being seen because the wait is so long. And it should be noted uh, that the outcome of uh, these high volumes also is that patients are not actually able to get into the hospital to get a bed. So they're boarding in the emergency room uh, at least overnight. And just this past Thursday night, that number reached over 20 folks who couldn't get into the hospital. So <clears throat> we put together an acute care triage committee uh, to help us prioritize um, our ability to use our capacity amongst all patients. So you heard about the surgery patients on the preceding slide, and this is in regard to all patients, including medical patients. And I should note that our providers and caregivers are indeed exhausted. You've probably read about this in the lay press uh, across the country. Um, we are at 18 months of the pandemic. Folks are working hard. They've been working hard that entire time. Uh, they're tired. Um, they are despairing of a light at the end of the tunnel uh, as we see each variant come up and as we recognize that um, our communities still have sizable numbers of folks who are not vaccinated. Next slide. I think it's important to note that Bend and our uh, tri-county area are not unique. Um, a couple of headlines are shown here. One that uh, the COVID hospitalizations now are rising faster in Oregon than ever before. Um, this is some, somewhat of a silent period for the pandemic. We keep hearing folks referring to the pandemic being over when in fact it's ramping up just as rapidly or more rapidly than it did during our uh, most dire periods at the latter part and early part of this year, the latter part of 2019, uh, early part of 2020 and early part of 2021. Um, <clears throat> and again, in May, we're looking at just, a difficult, just as difficult a time now. Uh, you've probably heard about uh, what's going on in Florida where uh, there are large numbers uh, among the population who are not vaccinated and folks are not wearing masks. And those hospitals are, um, filling up uh, as those cases hit an all-time high. And then I think some of the more tragic news that we've gotten is both the COVID-19 variant that you'll hear more about in a bit uh, is beginning to affect children far more than it originally did. And that whether we're talking about uh, babies or we're talking about um, adults, uh, many people are, are, are having to leave their area, be transported, uh, hours and hours away to find a hospital bed. And in some cases, even that won't work. So we know that exactly what we're facing is true around the country. Next slide. So I'll turn this back over to Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Merrill. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think, you know, Doug's painting a picture where we are very, very constrained, um, which makes it difficult for not just everybody that works in health, our healthcare organization, but it makes it very difficult for our patients in the community. Uh, this is an unprecedented set of circumstances that uh, I don't think any of us have seen or faced. And I think it's important to understand what's, what are some of the drivers of this beyond just thinking about people who become infected with COVID. Because the pandemic has, a, has had a much broader impact than just those that are positive or when we have surges. It's had a, a number of collateral ramifications on all aspects of the healthcare industry. And that's part of what we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about today, uh, just to try to help improve everybody's understanding of what some of those challenges are. You know, just starting at the with the basics, um, if you look across the St. Charles Health System, I, I think everyone knows we have four hospitals, Bend, Redmond, Prineville, and Madras. Um, across those hospitals, we have approximately 275 beds that are designated for 
uh, adult critical and acute care needs, so medical, surgical, ICU care, et cetera. Uh, we do have other beds in the health system that are for things like family birthing center, behavioral health, inpatient rehab that aren't counted in this number. Um, but the capacity that we generally have on a daily basis is about 275 beds across the health system. Uh, what we've seen just month after month uh, since the pandemic has begun is that we're running at max capacity pretty much every day. And when we're not, we're starting the day somewhere in 90, 95% occupancy. So just very, very full all of the time. That doesn't include some of the instances that Dr. Merrill indicated where there are times when we have um, 20 people boarding in the ED that need a bed. And um, on average, I think we're seeing about seven to 10 patients boarding overnight in the ED. And upon occasion, we're having to bed people in our uh, post-operative spaces as well overnight in order to accommodate all of the volume. So just really, really full. Uh, we do have space though, where we could accommodate a surge in volume. So there are other spaces within our health system that we could modify or bring into service relatively quickly in order to provide additional care. Uh, so right now, even though we're running full, it's not the physical space itself that's really our constraint. The constraint really lives in a couple of other areas and we'll, we'll touch on those. Uh, so the first of which is staffing. So as we try to surge and expand into additional patient care areas, we really need the nurses and certified nursing assistants and um, environmental services workers and physicians in order to be able to staff and provide care in those spaces. And that is one of our major constraints right now. It's not unique to the healthcare industry. I think we're seeing it all over our community as we see uh, restaurants and other um, organizations struggle to get enough staff to sustain their businesses. Healthcare is no different. Um, I would argue that it's exacerbated in healthcare because many of our healthcare workers across the nation and, and here at St. Charles are suffering from burnout and fatigue. Um, I'll share an example of um, one of the circumstances we're facing in particular here, here at the Bend campus. Um, to really staff our acute care and critical care needs here at Bend, we need about 600 nurses. Um, that's what we would generally recruit and staff for. Um, we have about 125 openings in those units today, um, and we have about 61 nurses on leave of absence. Many nurses are having to go on leave for burnout, fatigue, family issues, childcare issues. But together, this means that we're down, we have a vacancy rate of about 30, 31% just for this particular workforce. And so asking this group to manage a full hospital every day, asking people to continuously pick up extra shifts, uh, to work extended hours, month after month after month is not really a sustainable model. And our folks, are, our folks have been heroic in the way that they've responded and the way that they've continued to rally, the way that they continue to come and care for patients but it's not something we can rely upon to just keep going into the future. And we're gonna to have to solve for this problem. We'll talk about some of the things that we're doing lately, but at a minimum, it means it's difficult for us to surge up beyond 100% of our normal capacity. That has been the strategy for most health organizations as, as we've faced different COVID surges over the last year and a half, but it's very, very difficult to do that when we're running a deficit situation. And it's not just this group, it's all over our health system, it's physicians, um, and the ED is a great example of that. Not only are they managing their day-to-day -day volume, they're being asked to care for additional patients every day because we don't have beds for them. And that staff is having to go to the well again, day after day. So not sustainable for us. <clears throat> and, and I think it poses more risk because I think at one, I'll just add that at one point, I don't, I do believe we will see, continue to see additional turnover if we can't find a way to get these folks help and we can't uh, focus on reducing the demand on the services that we're providing. <clears throat> so we have some typical staffing barriers that other industries have in our community. Um, one is, you know, affordable housing makes it difficult for us to re recruit people into our community. We have multiple issues with childcare availability and supply in the community. I don't think that's a secret. I think many people who run businesses are facing this issue. We do have some unique challenges here in healthcare. We have many people leaving the workforce due to fatigue. Uh, we have many people choosing to retire early. 
Um, it has become highly, highly competitive to try to recruit healthcare workers. Uh, many nurses have chosen to move on to become travelers where they can travel around the country and they can demand top wages. Uh, so it's becoming very competitive between various communities as well. And we actually see this problem picking up over the next five years because we know we need to grow our workforce of nurses by about 2 million, in, 2 million over the next five year period. Yet when we look at nursing schools and the growth in the nursing workforce, it's only anticipated to be about 500,000. So this is an ongoing challenge for us. Uh, and it means we have to change how we recruit and we develop talent in our own community. We cannot afford to have to recruit everybody into Central Oregon. We're gonna have to do a better job of developing and creating pipelines. <clears throat> so flow of patients is important as well. So where do patients move throughout the healthcare continuum? And the healthcare continuum is really a vast ecosystem that consists of much, much more than just the hospital. So certainly many of you have primary care physicians and visit primary care physicians um, all over Bend, Redmond and in, in, in Central Oregon itself. We have urgent care facilities. Uh, we have wellness centers, all kinds of different venues in which people can seek care early, can manage their health and hopefully stay out of the hospital environment. And we have the same downstream of the hospital. We have home health services that provide care right in people's homes. We have skilled nursing facilities, we have rehab facilities, all of which take care of patients um, once they leave the hospital setting. One of the challenges we face in particular here at St. Charles is when any of these portions of the care continuum break down or have failures, the patients tend to congregate in the hospital. The hospital is the center of gravity. So when we have a breakdown, it means the hospital becomes overloaded. And we'll share a few examples of that. Uh, so if we're thinking about people coming into the hospital and keeping people well and keeping people healthy and keeping them out of the hospital setting, people need to get care. They need to get their checkup on, on a regular basis. They need to manage their medications. Uh, they need to stay active. They need to see their specialists on a regular basis. And we know once the pandemic started that many people avoided or deferred healthcare all of the 2020 uh, through last year. Uh, that has eased up a bit in 2021. People are getting back to accessing healthcare, but that delay, and you can see the numbers here, three in five US adults delaying care during the pandemic, really has added and built up to the backlog and pressure for our services. People have gotten sicker, they've gained weight, uh, they've been isolated, they've suffered from depression, alcoholism. We've seen just all of those elements increase. We've seen people's chronic uh, health conditions grow worse. And that's just added a ton of pressure to the demand for our services uh, here in the hospital. And if you add to it the delay in surgical cases that we had last year, the demand is just overwhelming. And we're not sure when the surges are gonna stop and we're gonna be able to get back to our normal access. We've seen a lot of increase in traumas as well. Uh, so we, we've seen about, a, we're projecting to have about a 25% increase in traumas here versus 2019 here in the hospital setting this year and 40% more than what we experienced last year. So just a much higher demand for hospital services than we've had in the past. We're also having challenges with flowing people out of the hospital and discharging people on a timely basis. You know, if you go back to 2019, the average patient stayed in the hospital for about four days. In 2021, that number is more like five days. So a whole day increase, a 25% increase in the length of stay for the average patient. So people are sicker, um, COVID infected people tend to stay in the hospital longer as an example, it means people need those beds longer and they're tying up resources longer. And it's much more difficult for us to discharge people to other healthcare settings once they no longer need hospital care. So here's a great example on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, this is from last Friday. We had 42 people in the hospital that no longer needed in the hospital but we could not transfer them or discharge them to a post-acute care setting. So skilled nursing facilities, we had 16 patients in the hospital waiting for a bed and a sniff. We had 13 patients in the hospital waiting for access to assisted living facilities. Uh, we had five patients in the hospital who were waiting for um, approval from the state for their disability uh, funding so they could move on to another care setting. Just to give you an example of that, um, you know, it's taking the state 30 to 45 days to review and approve those cases. 
So even though these patients are ready to move on to another setting, we have to hold on to these people for a month until we get those approvals. So again, when the post-acute setting breaks down, we struggle then to, um, uh, to manage flow and provide access in the hospital setting because the hospital gets stuck holding on to those folks. Um, and this is all happening even in between the surges that we continue to experience. So now the next surge is upon us. Uh, you can see the seven day cumulative add of new cases in our community. These are, this is the tri-county areas. You can see the spikes we experienced last year in 2020 and the beginning of this year. And on the very far right, you can see where we're at right now. We're headed right back to the peaks that we experienced in previous periods. And again, this all has to do with the Delta variant entering our community. But again, as these numbers in the community increase, the use of the hospital increases as well. So this is the inpatient census for COVID patients in the healthcare setting here at, uh, at St. Charles, predominantly at the Bend campus. You can see the spikes in those census in previous months. And you can see our projection, we're right here right now. We have about 40 patients in the hospital today um, and over the course of this last week. Um, and you can see our projection is to get up somewhere around 55 patients in the healthcare setting if we as a community practice good interventions and make good choices, meaning we get vaccinated, we social distance, we wear masks. If we don't do that, we expect this number to be much, much higher potentially over the coming weeks and throughout September. But 40 is a pretty significant increase. We were in single digits just two and a half weeks ago, and now we see ourselves at you know, 40 plus patients uh, here this week. Asante, um, just south of us, is experiencing the exact same thing. They're struggling to get interventions in their community. They have 119 COVID cases in, in their hospital today. Um, their hospital there in Asante is about 10 beds larger than our Bend facility here. So pretty comparable facilities, but you know, three and a half to four times the volume of patients. Um, and I think our hope is that we as a community can be responsible and head off those kinds of numbers because they would be catastrophic for us. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Marie to talk a little bit about the Delta variant, which is, which is at the heart of much of this. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and thank you to the community members for joining us and participating um, in this um, process that we have going on right now with the Delta variant. Um, I know I'm tired of talking about COVID and I'm sure everybody's tired of hearing about it, but unfortunately, COVID is still here um, with our new Delta variant. Next slide. So uh, why are we seeing so much Delta variant uh, currently in our community? It did march across the United States as many of the other variants have and settled into the Willamette Valley. And then we started to see Delta variant showing up here in our region about six weeks ago with about 5% of our samples uh, testing positive for the Delta variant. Um, rapidly over four weeks, we came to um, almost 100% of our um, positive samples uh, were of the Delta variant. Um, so what we see that's different about this variant from the other variants is that um, people who get infected with the Delta variant have a much higher viral load. And you can imagine if you have a much higher, higher viral load or inoculum of the virus, um, that you're gonna be much more contagious. And in fact, that is what we see that we see that um, for the unvaccinated, they are about twice as infectious as for other variants. Um, what we're seeing with infected um, patients who have breakthrough cases um, for vaccinated people is that they also are achieving high loads, viral loads, um, uh, when they get infected with the Delta variant. Um, we don't really know what that means for their infectivity, but the assumption is that they will also be um, extremely contagious um, if they are infected with this variant. Um, and, you know, more data is coming out all the time. So I think we will begin to understand a lot more around that um, in the future. Next slide. This is a nice graphic um, that I uh, borrowed from the CDC, um, which shows the um, transmission of the Delta variant and puts it on a continuum with other infections that we know, such as MERS, SARS, Ebola, common cold, seasonal flu, and smallpox, um, where the Delta variant is more transmissible. It is on the order of transmissibility with chickenpox. 
You can also see that it's on a um, scale um, on um, where it's slightly more um, um, dangerous and um, infections are more severe than the original uh, variant that we saw. Uh, I think that the evidence that we're seeing more and more is that this is causing more severe disease and that may move up even further on that fatality rate scale. Next slide. So this also poses a challenge for us because um, we do see directly related to the prevalence and incidence of um, the COVID infection within our community that this will affect um, how many caregivers are um, sick um, from this infection. Um, you can imagine our caregivers live in our community. And as we see the spread happen there, we also see the spread happen amongst our caregivers. And so we are rapidly seeing more active furloughs. Um, we also are um, at risk for having outbreaks that we've seen at uh, UCSF um, and also Asante with uh, increased spread. The other concern is um, for the skilled nursing facilities. If they have an outbreak, uh, they will close down for 14 days, which also um, puts jeopardy our ability to um, have patients and um, discharge to our skilled nursing facility and continue to care for other patients. Next slide. This is looking at our vaccine effectiveness. Um, the good news is our vaccines are still very effective for protecting us against severe disease and hospitalization. As you can see, the numbers there, 95 and 96% effective, effectiveness um, for the alpha variant versus the delta variant. Um, where we do see some difference is in our breakthrough cases where you see symptomatic disease. Um, so you can see that we do have a lower effectiveness of the, for the delta variant with our current vaccine. Um, I, this number may creep down even lower. I think as we start to gather more data, we are seeing uh, symptomatic breakthrough cases. Uh, it is still rare, but we are seeing more of it. Um, these vaccines are incredibly effective, the most effective vaccines that we've created, um, and they're um, very safe, uh, and they are helping us prevent that hospitalization and death. Um, but we are seeing more people with that breakthrough disease, which is concerning because not only um, are they getting sick and no one wants to get sick and they're not feeling well, um, but also they're able to spread the virus um, within our community. Next slide. So what is what do we know about our current vaccination rates? Next slide. This is a slide from the Tri-Counties that shows our current vaccination rates for our 12 and older. And as you can see, as a total, we're still hovering in that 66%. Um, so when you look at our whole population, of course, we're uh, much worse. We're closer to the 50s because, um, of course, every person uh, matters when you're looking at herd immunity. Um, and when we look at this virus in particular, um, that we're seeing with this variant, we really need to be closer to 85% to reach herd immunity because of the increased transmissibility of this virus. So um, currently um, we still have about 65,000 people in our tri-counties that have either not been exposed to COVID or have not been vaccinated. So that's a large amount of people still very susceptible to this um, virus that is currently circulating. Next slide. Here at St. Charles, we have about 76% of our total caregivers who are vaccinated. You can see the spectrum of vaccination rates amongst our four campuses. Um, and uh, we did see a large proportion of our caregivers initially getting vaccinated, um, but there has not been as many um, caregivers vaccinated um, recently. Um, although with this new variant cy um, cycling around, we have seen a slight increase in um, demand for vaccine. Next slide. This is a graphic also I took from the CDC that I think really well illustrates the relationship of vaccination rate with case rate. And as you can see, the lower your vaccine, the percentage of the vaccinated population in the state, um, the more cases you have, and it's directly related to that. Next slide. This is um, currently the new health and safety rule um, that has been announced recently. Um, and in this rule, uh, will uh, healthcare workers, providers, and staff persons will be required to show proof of vaccination or undergo weekly COVID-19 testing. Um, full compliance to this rule is required no later than September 30th. 
We are currently actively gathering um, further information from the state regarding the details of this new rule. Um, and we understand COVID-19 vaccination is a personal decision and our aim is to support our caregivers as best as we can as we transition to comply with this new requirement. Next slide. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Julie. Thanks, Dr. Marie. I'm gonna spend a few minutes sharing with you um, the work that we have going on to manage through uh, all of the things that have been described already by Aaron and Dr. Merrill and Dr. Marie. Uh, we still have to run our hospitals and our health system, and we're really uh, working hard to pull in all the available resources and think outside of the box to use some creative ideas here. Um, so you'll see on this uh, slide here, there's several bullets under a couple of categories. On the left-hand side, um, we're talking about things that we are working through to address the staffing issues, sourcing and retention, retention of our people resources. Uh, as I think Aaron and Doug Merrill both touched on, uh, they're our most precious resource and also where we see the biggest pinch point, where we're having the biggest challenge in expanding care and bringing more patients into the ho hospital and health system. So we're doing several things here. Um, a couple of things that I wanna highlight are our new grad RN fellowships. Uh, this is a process and a tool that is common in the industry across the country and really the world um, in, in many places. And we have launched into that work in a way that's going to help us better support new graduate nurses as they come out of school and bring them into the St. Charles community with support and tools available to them uh, that are proven to increase retention and satisfaction of our new nurses. We're working really hard on these pipelines. Um, I think Aaron touched on this a little bit, but we have to find ways to engage with people who are already living in the Central Oregon communities to develop skill sets uh, to bring them into the clinical caregiver uh, family and create that flow for people because we face so many challenges in recruiting people into our community from outside areas. Um, additionally, we are spending a fair amount of organizational energy advocating at the state level with the governor's office and other groups. Uh, we have made requests at the state level like National Guard support. Uh, we have asked them to help us source caregivers and employees, nurses, um, resources, whatever that might look like to help us expand our ability to care for more patients. We have hundreds of patients waiting in the community for surgical care and all of those pathways have to be explored. So we're spending um, a good deal of energy there uh, asking for assistance at the state level. In addition to our people resource work, uh, we're working on how we move patients through their care in the health system and in the community. So before they get here to see us in the health system at our hospital campuses and after they leave us, there are other areas where we're spending energy to increase access to those care resources. A lot of this involves partnership with organizations in the community that aren't St. Charles owned. Uh, for example, we are working with one of our local skilled nursing facilities to um, identify staff within the St. Charles Health System that maybe aren't currently providing direct patient care and could be reassigned to that space to allow them to open up more beds so that we can move patients out of the hospital that don't need to use our resources right now. They're waiting to go to a rehab or skilled nursing facility um, and occupying a hospital bed in the meantime. So that's just one example of how we're trying to think outside of our normal patterns and partner with our community uh, agencies to help move patients through their care needs. Next slide. We're also doing some work to help identify patients' needs before they get to the hospital. Um, there are several scenarios we could talk through that illustrate um, the opportunities for people to get their um, illnesses or injuries cared for before they reach the point that they're sick enough to need hospital care. We're working internally to expand access to urgent care or immediate care resources in the community, both St. Charles and the other partners who offer that service in our environment. Um, 
all of the clinics in the Central Oregon area are working hard to expand access to same day or next day appointments so that people can get in to see their primary care doctors or established specialists before they need to be admitted to the hospital or uh, be seen in our emergency department. Uh, and of course, we are continuing to um, talk about everywhere we have the opportunity, the importance of vaccination rates in preventing the further spread of this virus um, and consuming more of our Central Oregon healthcare resources. Within the walls of our hospitals, uh, we're also doing a lot of work to optimize what we have available. We are putting a lot of energy into the work that was described earlier to prioritize patients waiting for surgical services, um, to review and establish alternative options for patients who might be using medical resources at the hospital level who don't need them. Um, and then we also have work going on with cohorting patients where our focus is to identify patients like COVID positive patients or patients waiting for a SNF level of care at a rehab center somewhere. Um, and really physically locating them together in a way that allows us to optimize the staff that are required to care for them and the physical environment that they're being provided care within. All of those things are also serving as experiments as we work on longer term planning um, to identify what we need as we expand the health system into future years. So thank you, Julie. I um, I think, you know, our goal has been to try to be transparent and try to help folks understand the complexities of some of the issues that we're facing. And, and there are multiple complex issues here. Some are within the walls of St. Charles. Some exist outside the wall of St. Charles. Um, they're not uncommon to what others in various communities across the country are experiencing. They're very difficult. We have a lot of good work underway to try to improve upon the situation. Um, but I think the reality is, is it is very difficult and it's not clear when we're going to experience relief. Uh, and the Delta variant here on this slide says the Delta variant is on the horizon. It's not on the horizon, it's here. And so that is just going to continue to exacerbate our challenges. So it's the unfortunate reality where, the, where we're at. Um, there is no way to sugarcoat it. We are in difficult situation. And it's going to take everybody within our organization and within our community to try to make a difference and to try to hold off the challenges that we're facing. So um, it's also important that folks that see this um, video and see our town hall materials today, that they do their part. And there's actually quite a bit that you can do. Uh, there's actually a lot that you can do uh, to try to help improve our circumstances. And I think Dr. Merrill is going to talk about what some of those choices are. Absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, this slide is our last one, and it takes you on a tour of the sort of six areas that you can make a difference with. Uh, the number one by far is getting vaccinated. So the good news is that a uh, majority of, uh, of eligible folks have gotten vaccinated in our area. The bad news is that not enough folks have, as Dr. Marie showed us. So if you're one of the vaccinated uh, people, thank you. Um, you're doing the most that can be done, I think, <clears throat> to help with this situation, but we sure could use your help in getting the message out to your family and friends to get vaccinated as well. Even if you're vaccinated at this point in time, it's important to wear a mask when you're out in public. Um, the uh, remarkable numbers that Dr. Marie shared with us about how transmissible this uh, virus is shows that even if we're vaccinated, there's a, a potential for us to infect others if we're uh, unaware that we're infected. And by the same token, we're extra protected from those who uh, might accidentally uh, transmit the virus to us. So model uh, great behavior by wearing a mask when you're out there. See your doctor. Uh, if you are feeling ill, get tested. And, um, and then obviously follow directions, including quarantining uh, if you're positive. Uh, the seven pillars of self-care, uh, all of them are important, but I think the number one is to wash your hands. Um, as uh, has been told to folks since the very beginning of the pandemic uh, and for years before that, good hand hygiene will save you uh, from this virus and, and many other illnesses. Um, 
don't delay your care. Uh, make sure that you get the care you need. Um, and uh, as you have seen, uh, delays in care for disease uh, can lead to serious illness that puts you in the hospital, uh, just like COVID patients. And then finally, get the word out on these elements, how you can help, uh, and uh, tell friends, tell family to get vaccinated and to wear masks. And with that, I'll thank you, and we'll turn it over to questions. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Merrill, and the rest of our panelists for that presentation. Lots of great information in there. So I will go ahead and start taking questions. I see that we already have a number of them coming in from both uh, our news media partners and members of our community. Uh, so I will start uh, with the news media. This one from Ted Sickinger. Can you tell us what, if any, support St. Charles has received from the county on other mitigation measures? Has St. Charles requested a masking mandate or any other intervention? Dr. Absalon, I know you've been in touch on most of those circumstances. Do you mind weighing in here? Sure, happy to. Thanks and hi everybody. Um, we have asked our county commissioners to consider a masking mandate for indoor activities. Uh, we've also circulated this to our, our um, city councils as well. And it is very important that we um, uh, have people do the masking as much as is absolutely possible. And Lisa, I wanna ask, I, I'm not, can you clarify about the city? Um, Cause I know we did to the board of commissioners. Yes, we, we did, uh, the organization sent a letter to both the Redmond and Ben city councils, encouraging the communities to, to mask. Um, and then indeed we did send a letter to the board of county commissioners uh, asking the board as our local public health authority to consider a mask mandate. Um, I think the other piece of that question, Dr. Absalon, um, are there any other mitigation measures we're pursuing? Um, a follow-up from Lynn Terry at the Lund Report on that same note. She'd like to know if we've asked the state for any help and what the response has been, and could we provide any more details on the National Guard's involvement? Yeah, so uh, let, me, let me take a little bit on the National Guard request. So we have asked for National Guard help. Unfortunately, um, as you can see, our shortages really with nursing staff is a predominant issue. And the amount of nursing staff that's available within our state in the National Guard is relatively limited. In fact, they're, they are currently working in other locations. So our, our initial response is that we're not likely to receive nursing staff, but we're currently going through the process right now to define if there are other potential National Guard resources that can be helpful um, anywhere throughout our health systems at this time. So we're collecting that information and communicating and we'll be looking to see if, uh, if we're able to receive any support in that regard. In addition to that, I do know that the state has been looking um, to address the statewide incident command structure to help with potentially um, supporting health systems throughout the entirety of the state. We've been in this structure for a number of months um, and they're looking to potentially move to a level three structure where there may be better ability to coordinate um, the presence of resources that are constrained in certain environments and getting patients to the locations where they'll be able to have access to those resources. With all that being said, you know, we've been doing our work internally and externally to request support, but as you can see, we're not in this alone, and this is a problem throughout the state, and so thus far we've not been able to receive um, significant hands-on support, but we'll continue to work to um, explore all of these possibilities. Yeah, I would add too that our advocacy takes many forms. So some of it is resource in nature, some of it is bureaucratic in nature. So things such as um, getting the approval for people with disabilities, getting that reviewed and approved every week as opposed to every month or every quarter. Uh, there are things around um, how we license nurses we're bringing into the state. We're not part of the multi-state compact that other states are part of that allows nurses to move within states under their um, local state licensure. Uh, Oregon is separate from that. Uh, during the pandemic, that was relaxed. At the beginning of the pandemic, that was relaxed nationally. Um, and we're asking for advocacy to uh, relax that standard now going forward so we can move people into the community much, much easier. So there's a whole number of things that we're pursuing as we have these conversations. Great. 
Uh, next question um, from Megan Glova. Aaron mentioned unique staffing challenges. Does St. Charles anticipate that will include the recent requirement for healthcare workers to be vaccinated or be consistently tested? Are you worried that that will make your staffing situation even harder? Um, yeah, it's a it's a mixed um, mixed bag here, right? Um, I think when you look at the numbers of uh, people who get infected in other health systems, both in predominantly in their community, picking up the disease and and bringing it into the workplace or having to be furloughed, we have to minimize that as much as possible, and we have to minimize community transmission as much as possible. And the best way to do that is to get vaccinated. So these mandates or these requirements um, are very very important, I think, in the bigger picture. There's, there's some personal choice that's associated with this that could have some drawbacks. We're certainly aware of that. Uh, we're doing our best to try to balance both of those priorities. Um, we're still working on a lot of the logistics of how we would actually carry out this health and safety rule and how we might do so in a way that's palatable for our workforce. So there's still a lot that's unknown here, but we, we still need to pursue those vaccinations. And I think we understand and support why the governor's office did this. Um, this is from Erin Ross, Oregon Public Broadcasting. Can you tell us anything about the county's response to your request to consider a mask mandate? How did they respond at the time and has there been any movement? Dr. Absalom, would you like to take that? Yeah, the, the county has not instituted a masking mandate at this time. And uh, we appreciate that Multnomah County made a statement uh, yesterday with this regard. And um, unfortunately, in our local uh, communities, we have not had a response or there's not been um, moving any movement, movement forward with regards to masking mandates at this time. Um, this is from Barney. Have you set a new date on how long elective surgeries are postponed or is that indefinite? Um, Julie, would you like to take that one? Sure. Uh, what we've learned over the last year and a half is that this uh, process and the duration of the pandemic isn't predictable. Um, so at the moment, our plan through the end of this year is to um, not schedule elective surgeries until they've been reviewed and prioritized. This, what this is going to do is prevent our community members, patients, and surgeons from experiencing repeated scheduling and cancellations. Um, so we are doing some elective surgeries, but they are having to be prioritized pretty heavily, and we will continue with this process at least through the end of the year, most likely. Okay, great. Thank you. I, you know, I just would add to that, um, Lisa. So I, I would say we get a lot of feedback from our surgeons and their offices about the impact this has on patients. And it's troubling. It's not uh, the type of care that anybody wants to provide. Um, it, we need to try to find a way to improve the situation, but it is not the surgeon office's fault. It's not the fault of the surgeons. It's not the fault of their office staff. It's just an unfortunate circumstance we find ourselves in that's delaying care for everybody. I know that many of those physician practices in the community have had just a lot of difficulty communicating and helping their uh, patients understand because their patients are in need and they need care. But I think we just want to emphasize that this isn't the fault of your surgeons. They're desperately trying to work with us to find ways to get people through the system and get them cared for. We're working on this every day, all the time. We were up on the phone at 630 this morning with several dozen physicians just talking through options and things that we can continue to do just to get a few more people through the pipeline. So I just want you to know they're working very hard on your behalf. They're trying their best to partner with us. We're partnering with everybody that we can to try to improve the situation. I just, I just wanted to share that because I know it's been very tough on them personally and the people that work with them. Great. I don't see any other questions from the news media and the chat function. I'll give you one moment to think uh, on that if you have any last minute questions. In the meantime, I'm gonna take one question from a viewer. Uh, what will happen if an emergency surgery is needed? Can I get in to get the care I need? Julie, maybe you can take that. Take that one, Lisa. Uh, yes, absolutely. Part of what we're doing around um, our hospital capacity and managing elective surgeries is assuring that we are maintaining the ability to take care of people who arrive to our hospitals or clinics with emergency or um, urgent level needs. 
who need surgery or other procedural care. That goes for patients who need um, care in our cath lab for cardiac or uh, vascular or neurology treatment, as well as surgical cases. Uh, so that is, is and will continue to be a cornerstone of the work we're doing, is maintaining our ability to take care of people who have emergency needs, who are in traumatic accidents, or who have life-threatening illnesses and present to the hospital in those states. Okay, great. Well, seeing no more questions from our news media partners, and I also recognize that we have uh, many questions from our community members. We apologize uh, due to technical difficulties. We did get started late today, so we are going to have to sign off now. Uh, but we do appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. Uh, if the news media have follow-up questions, please reach out to me directly, and I'm help, happy to help facilitate uh, getting those answers for you. And to our uh, general public, thank you for your patience today. While we got some of our technical problems sorted out, we will be posting a recording of this full presentation online for everyone to access should they need to do so, or if they'd like to share it with anyone else. Uh, thank you very much uh, to you all again for joining us today and helping understand uh, what's happening at our hospitals right now. Uh, we need your partnership to get through this. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here. And with that, we will end today's call. Thank you so much.